hope and I want to give a little bit of help into your very hearts and souls this morning. The title of my message is called Work Your Window. And what I mean by that is that in each one of our lives we have a window of opportunity. That there are certain moments that we get to maximize to this full potential and if we don't the window will be closed. And I really feel that as I've been preparing for this message to come and share with you guys here in Blanche in Navin and in Dundalk, that you have a window of opportunity and God wants you to work that window. God's desire is that we live a life all in by taking the right opportunities with extraordinary faith. That we need to commit to trusting God till the very end and not to stop short and not to quit. So there's a portion of scripture it is found in the Old Testament. It is 2 Kings 13, 14 to 16. And I, I just want to read this out. And what we're going to do with the rest of our time this morning, we're just going to pull apart some very simple application points that we can just put into our lives. And so we're going to kick off. It says in verse 14, it says, Now Elisha had been suffering from an illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. He said, My father, my father. He cried, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and get some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. He said, open the east window. And he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. Completely destroy the Arameans of Abek. In verse 18 it goes on and says, Then he said, Take the arrows. And the king took them. He said, Strike the ground. He struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only so I just get everybody to stand here in Blanche, in Dundalk, and in Navin. I just want to pray over the word this morning. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that your presence is in this place. I thank you, Lord, that as your word goes out, that it will, it will accomplish what it is that you have wanted to accomplish in the lives of people. I pray, Lord, that you make our hearts perceptive our eyes open and our ears open to hear what it is that you would speak to us in this place this morning. And may you get all the honor and may you get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you take your seats, just nudge the person beside you and say, hey, it's good to have you with us. So a, a little bit of context. In this story here, we see that the king of Israel, Joash, that he is come to this juncture where the king of Judah, there's this rivalry, there's this conflict. And he's going down to the prophet, he's going down to the man of God, the voice of God, Elisha. Because he hears that Elisha 
is sick. And it says that he is sick with an illness that he's going to die from. So what we see is that Johash, he's going down. He's not going down necessarily because he wants to grieve the sorrow of the loss of a prophet, but he's going down because he's grieving the loss of protection over the nation of Israel. And as he goes down, he's having this discourse, he's having this talk with the prophet of God. And Elisha gives him a set of instructions. And I don't know about you, but, but when I read this, when I read it, or when I seen it first, I'm like, that's a weird set of instructions. Like, some of the instructions are very open-ended. Like, one day, me and my wife, we were coming home. She was, she was pregnant. We were coming home from a visit to the hospital. And she was starving. She has this thing called hunger. It's when you get hungry and angry. And she said, Niall, stop at the petrol station. And I was like, okay, bet, I'll stop. She's like, all I want is a Snickers Jewel. I was like, I've got that. I'll get you your Snickers Jewel. Perfect. This mic will give me my singing voice. I love it. She said, Niall, get me a Snickers Jewel. And I was like, pet, I've got your back. I love you. Don't you worry. Went in. I could not find a Snickers Jewel. So I done what any hungry man would do. I went to the coffee machine, got myself a coffee. I went and I got myself a roll. And I went and I got myself a bar. And as I was going up to pay for it, I noticed that there was a line bar jewel. So I was like, a line bar and a Snickers bar are pretty much the same. I got into the car. My wife, she was still very, very angry. I'm very, very hungry. So I said, pet, they didn't have a line bar, or they didn't have a Snickers bar jewel, but I got you the next best thing. I got you a line bar jewel. And she's like, no, I didn't want a line bar jewel. She's like, why couldn't you have just done what I asked you to do? I said, I did. She's like, no, I did have a single Snickers. I was like, yes, but they didn't have a jewel. And she's like, what was going on in your head? In what world is a line bar and a Snickers the same? And I could tell that she was getting very unreasonable at this moment. So I, I realized that there was a window of opportunity for me. And I was like, okay, Pat, I'm so sorry. I was like, do you want me to go back in and get the Snickers? And she's like, it's okay. You've ruined it. So long story short, I had a roll, I had a bar, I had a cup of coffee, and I had a lime bar jewel. It was fantastic. But <laughs> the reason I tell you that is that sometimes some of us expect the instructions that were given to be so, so detailed. Some of us, we can't function if it's not detailed instructions. Well, how many of you know that when it comes to the life of faith, when it comes to following Jesus, that sometimes the instructions are open-ended? Sometimes we're not given every piece of the puzzle. Sometimes we're not given every piece of the jigsaw. And this is what we see in this conversation and in this situation. That the prophet of God, he says, you need to do this. You need to open the window. And what I love about this is that the prophet of God didn't go and open up the window. And what I really believe for each and every single person here today is that you are the one that is to open your window. No one else is going to open your window. If you want God to do something in your life, you need to get up and you need to make the first move. Now I know, I know that in Dundalk and in Navin, you guys, you are fantastic when it comes to architecture, when it comes to history, all of that stuff, but I'm not. I'm a simple Carla man from Tullo. So as I was studying this, what stood out to me was the eastern window. Why is the eastern window so important? Why did the prophet ask the man of, ask the king to open up the eastern window? Here's why. When we look at the church buildings that have been built, what happens is that in those buildings, you will have the biggest stained glass window. The biggest window in the church or in the building will be the eastern window. The reason to have it as the eastern window is because it symbolizes that when Jesus died, that when he rose again, he rose from the east. So it symbolizes that there's death, but then there's life. That there's resurrection power. And I, I, I believe that when he said that you need to shoot out the eastern window, that he was saying that there's going to be life from this. That there's going to be hope from this. That if you do it from this window, that it symbolizes, it's a prophetic statement of what God wants to do in and through your lives. And it all centers around one decision. And this is what I find 
so fascinating. And in a sense, it's a little bit frustrating because the, the future that the king could have had all hinges on one decision. Elisha, the fact that the king stopped striking the arrow was connected to his determination to receive the full measure of God's intention for him. And he quit. And because he quit, the victory was lost. Do you know that the degree to which you believe God for the victory is the degree to which you will receive the victory? What are you believing God for this morning? Have you become the kind of person who is always looking for the least that you can do? Trying to do only what is required. And in a sense, this is what we learn from this story. We see that he shot the arrow out of the window. And then he took the arrows and he was striking the ground. Do you know that arrows are not for decor? Arrows are for battle. And the question that we need to answer, the question that we should answer this morning is, am I the kind of person who strikes three times and then stops? Or am I the kind of person who will just keep striking and striking and striking until there are no arrows left? God was ready to help Joash to the degree to which he would believe him for help. You need to see the victory in order to seize the victory. So let me just clarify this. Well, we're called to walk by faith, not by sight. But sometimes we need to know what it is that we're aiming for. What it is that we're aiming at. I don't know what you brought into this place today. I don't know what you're carrying in Navin. I don't know what you're carrying in Dundalk. But what I do know is that God knows what you're carrying. And if you want to see the victory, you need to be able to see the victory in order to seize it. You need to know what it is that you're working at. What it is that you're working through. What it is that you're working for. You need to work your window. There's a portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 8. And it says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be, re 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 be rewarded according to their own labor. I guess my wife was right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we, we have windows of opportunity. And I want you to get this, that the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. When we go to the shop, we see that there's sell-by dates. We see that there's the best before dates. And I really believe, especially when we read this portion of Scripture in 2 Kings, that there was a sell-by date, there was a use-by date, there was a best before date when it came to Joash striking the arrows on the ground. Let's not be those people that just retreat. Let's not be those people that just pull back and do as little is, as is required of us. Let's always be willing to give more. Let's always be willing to lean in a little bit more. In, in the Bible, there's this thing called proximity. There's a principle of proximity. And simply put, proximity means just being closer to it than anybody else. That there are certain things in life, above talent, above ability, above charisma, above whatever, that makes the difference in people's lives. And it's this thing of just being present, of just being in the moment. And I think one of the things that we can do is we can underestimate the importance of being present, of just being present in the moment. Do you know that here in Blanchardstown, that in Dundalk and in Navin, that this moment, this moment is where the past and the future collide. And within this moment, there's monumental power, there's monumental potential, and there's monumental purpose. And all we have to do is we just have to strike in. We just need to lean in and seize what it is that God will want to do. And it, there's a story in John 6. I'm not going to read out from Scripture, but it's when Jesus fed the 5,000. And what we see is we see the principle of proximity at play. There was a little boy and he had lunch. And we see that the disciples, that for some reason, they used the little boy's lunch to be able to feed the 5,000 people. And in a sense, it was Jesus. Jesus took what was in the little boy's hands and Jesus made the less more. He made that what was small big. 
And, and look, Jesus is the story. Jesus is the hero in this story. But I just want to camp out the little boy. How did the little boy find himself in the inner circle? How did the little boy find himself so close to Jesus and the disciples that when there was this problem, that he was going to be the solution, that he was going to be the answer to the problem? Can you just picture him, a little boy with his lunchbox, and just pushing through the, the multitude of people, and he finds himself in this place. It's, he found himself in close proximity to Jesus. And if you want Jesus to do anything big in your life, if you want Jesus to do the miraculous in your life, if you're looking for breakthrough, whatever, are you in close proximity to Jesus? Are you in close presence with Jesus? Because if you are, then the fruit is ripe for the picking. And maybe, you know, this is your first time you're stepping into a church like this, and you're like, okay, I get it, it's nice for other people. But the reality is, it's not just for other people, it's, it's for everybody. It's for everybody. And so, let's just bring it back to, to Elisha. And we see this is a paradox of how God works in our lives. That we are to shoot, and we are to strike, but what we are not to do is stop. We are to shoot, we are to strike, but we are not called to stop. And most of us live our lives as if our arrows are too valuable. Most of us live our lives as if the arrows in our quiver are too nice to let go, they're too nice to use. I don't know about you, but I, I didn't get a haircut this week, okay? I said to my wife last night, I was like, Ruth, I look like a fluffy sheep. I can't go up to the good-looking people in Dublin, to the good-looking people in Mead, and look like a fluffy sheep. They'll definitely think I'm a farmer from the country. So, Ruth, she cut my hair, and she's done a good job, I think. <laughs> but it was important, because I wanted to look my best. I wanted to put my best out. But when we look at the arrows that we have in our quiver, they're not just for show. They're not just for decoration. Arrows are meant for battle. The arrow only has value if you release it and it travels where you cannot travel yourself. When we look at ancient warfare, when we look at the weapons, like you would think of a sword. A sword never left your hand. The sword was for close combat. I would not like to fight Pastor Jamie Corcoran with a sword. He would beat me, but I definitely would beat him with a bow and arrow. Because I'd be hiding to the left, I'd be, hi I'd be hiding out of sight. But what the arrow does is the arrow extends your range of impact. The arrow extends what it is that God wants to do in your life. And it only has value when it is put into your hand and then released. Why are you holding on to the thing that should be left fly? And Elisha clearly asked Joash to do the same thing. And this same thing, model prayer. So remember, we're called to shoot the arrow. We're called to strike the arrow. But we're not called to stop. So shooting the arrow re requires effort and aim. Shooting the arrow requires instruction and help from the prophet of God. Shooting the arrow has to be done through an open window. Remember, you need to work your window. Shooting the arrow has to be done without knowing the exact outcome ahead of time that the target was only fully known by faith shooting the arrow was ineffective because it was not repeated enough times reflecting a lack of confidence in the process do you get that that it was ineffective because it was not repeated enough of times and what we see here is that the arrow is symbolic of prayer I really believe, I, I really do with, with every fiber of my being that I can pray and God can answer. But can I be honest with you? I believe God can heal. I prayed for so many people to get healed and they didn't get healed. In fact, <laughs> I have a story. I was praying for a lady one day. She had pain in her back and she came up and she's like, could you just pay for, pray for my back pain? I was like, yeah, come on, let's do it. Do you mind if I put my hands on your shoulder? She's like, no, you go ahead, you do that put my hands on her shoulder and I was, I was like revved up. I was believing for this and I prayed that the pain would go and that she would be healed. And I was so confident. I looked at her and I was like, it worked? And she's like, no, it's actually worse. 
I was like, no, 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 come on, let's just push through. So I prayed again, and do you know what? Prayers are more powerful if you shout. So I shouted a little bit louder this time, and at the end of it, I was like, how are you doing? And she's like, it's worse. I think I'll sit down. <laughs> and she walked away, and I was like, God, I believe that you can heal, but the reality is I don't heal anybody. It is God. But what I want you to get from this is that our prayers are like arrows, that we are called to keep firing, we're called to keep shooting, to keep shooting, to not stop. And sometimes we come up short because we stop. Though the prophet Elisha was the agent of the exchange, the future was literally placed in the king's hands by God himself. We have this thing called the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. God has a certain part for you to play. God will never give you a chair, but God will give you a tree. God will never give you a tear. He, he'll give you the material in order to, for you to be able to work it, to mold it, and to shape it for a purpose. And when I look around the room here, and even with Dundalk and Navin, do you know what? There is so much potential and purpose that's untapped. And I think what happens is sometimes it's untapped because we've stopped short. And if I was to be completely honest with you, I've stopped short. There's been times in my life where I've given in too soon. I look back. I'm like, God, I missed that window of opportunity. And I know in my heart that I didn't work that window the way that I should have. There are many situations in which we should keep shooting the arrows, but we content ourselves with small efforts. Do you know what I love? When I walked into this place this morning, and it was like ants, just busy at work, doing phenomenal work. Like your, your dream team, your volunteers here are unbelievable. Me, me and Ruth, yeah, come on, in all locations, in, in Blanche, in Navin, in Dundalk. Honestly, we would struggle to get our guys, and we love our guys, but we would struggle to get them up at seven, half seven to get in. But do you know what it is? It's that they've caught a glimpse of the vision of what God wants to do. And it's not about them, it's about what God can do. And there's this window of opportunity that God wants you to maximize to its full potential. And we're to shoot and we are to strike. We need to keep shooting in the battle against sin. We're, we need to keep shooting in the attainment of Christian knowledge. We're to keep shooting in the attainment of faith. We're to keep shooting to do more for the kingdom of God. Keep shooting because the world and the flesh and the devil will not stop. We need to keep shooting for the battle for lost souls. And we need to keep shooting in the fight for the things of God. We're to strike. We're to shoot. We're not to stop. It says that because the king stopped on three, the prophet of God said, but now you will strike Syria only three times. Seemingly small actions were vitally connected to what God wanted to do in the life of the king. We think of all the excuses. Sometimes we can have so, so many excuses. Of why I don't want to give a little bit more. Of why I don't want to just go there or, or do that. But what we need to do is we need to push past that. And I, I think that there's people here listening to this message this morning and you know that you stopped up short. You know that you had a little bit more to give. And this isn't to condemn you. This is to, to put hope in you. That you can dust yourself off and you can get back in the race and you can keep shooting and you can keep striking. We're not looking for perfection. I said to a lady one day, I was like, good enough isn't good enough if you can do better. And she didn't take it well. <laughs> but I really do believe it. That good enough isn't good enough if we can do better. Again, this isn't workspace. It, it really isn't. But do not... Leave the arrows in your quiver. But I know when it comes to the things of God, that when your quiver is empty, God will fill it up with more arrows. We say, I stopped shooting because I didn't want to be presumptuous and ask for too much. I stopped shooting because I'm not a very good archer. 
I, I stopped shooting because I, my aim was off. I stopped shooting because Elisha didn't help me. I stopped shooting because uh, I just didn't feel like it. We need to get that. Uh, we, we need to put that to the side. He says in verse 16, Take the bow in your hands, he said to king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And what I love about this is we could so easily just brush over this. But there's this wonderful picture of a partnership, of, of collaboration. Now remember when the king went down to see Elisha, Elisha was, was sick, he was an old man. And Elisha's hand would have been very frail. But it didn't matter. What mattered was the fact that Elisha put his hand on the king's hand. And it symbolized that we're in this together. Let's do this together. God would ask you to partner with the promise that he has for Blanchardstown. God will ask you to partner with the promise that he has for Navin. God is asking you to partner with the promise that he has for Dundalk. And that when you partner with the promise, he's saying, will you keep striking? Will you keep shooting? Will you keep striking? Keep striking. Keep shooting. Don't stop. Elisha extended to the king an opportunity to participate in an, in an enacted prophecy that would symbolize the future victories over the Syrians. He invited them in. I believe that the Lord, that God, he is inviting us into something this morning. And he said, I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to cajole you. I'm not going to drive you in fear, but I'm going to lovingly invite you to partner with me. The walk of faith is sometimes a walk of perseverance. And when the answer does not come the first time, faith does not quit. Faith continues to ask. It continues to pray. Keep striking. Keep shooting. But don't you stop. Don't you stop. A couple of years ago, uh, before me and Ruth got married, uh, well, no, it was after me and Ruth got married, sorry. Um, I moved up to Dublin. Um, we were living out in Donnemead. And we were, I think it was six, seven months into, into the marriage. All going well, honeymoon period, all that good stuff. And Era, our eldest daughter, so I used to get up and make her breakfast, all of this good stuff, just trying to be a loving father. And one day, she, she had the idea that she was going to make me breakfast. And I was like, okay, yeah, no, fantastic. Let, yeah, let's do it. So you're going to see a picture. And this picture, I think, Aira, she's five. And she arrives to the side of the bed. And she's looking tired. She's looking a little bit windswept. And she has something in her hand. And she's like, Dad, Dad, I made your breakfast. And I was like, oh, you're so good. And she's like, yeah. And that I even picked all the mold out of the bread. And Ruth was lying beside me. And Ruth perked up her little head like a meerkat. And she's like, oh, Aaron, that's such a lovely thing to do. Niall, you have to eat that right now. And I was like, Era, I love you. Thank you so much for making me breakfast. Thank you for making me, for picking all the mold out of the bread. Even though that bread was well past its sell by date. And Ruth was, she was like, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. It's like any loving father, what did I do? I ate it. And when she had her back turned, I threw it in the bin. <laughs> But what I learned from that moment, I wasn't expecting perfection out of my five-year-old daughter. It was the fact that she was willing to do something for me. And can, I, can I encourage you, God's not looking for your perfection this morning. God's looking for your presence. We get it wrong. We, we stop up short because we're like, I don't have it all together. Can I be honest with you? I don't have it all together. There is nobody in this room, and I'm sure when you look around on Dock and Navin, nobody has it all together. But Jesus has it all together. 
And he is inviting you into something this morning. Remember we said that this moment, this is where the past and the future collide. And it's this moment that has the monumental power and the potential and the purpose. This is the moment that you get to empty your quiver of the arrows. This is the moment that you get to strike. This is the moment that you get to shoot. This is the moment that you get to push through and not stop. What comes next?